This video is going to cover the unit 3 in neurobiology part of the higher human biology course and it's going to cover the third topic which is memory. So memory can be quite a complex topic um, mainly just because people tend not to explain it correctly um, or describe examples correctly but actually it's something that you're really familiar with because you all use it. So memory you might not really be aware of this but it actually involves a number of things that you probably wouldn't have been able to explain but you actually know it when you hear it. So it involves your knowledge, it involves stuff that you've experienced in the past and also your thoughts. So when you pull back any memory, it'll involve a whole range of those things. And to create memories, what you need to do is you need to encode it, you need to store it and you also need to be able to retrieve it. Now encoding you might have heard of before, I'm going to cover that in a wee bit. You'll know what storage is and you might know what retrieval is. Retrieval basically means to just to pull something back. So there's no point in having a memory if you aren't, you aren't able to then actually remember it in the first place. Okay, so memory has actually got quite a number of aspects to it. So the very first aspect is something that you probably won't have heard of before, which is sensory memory. Now, if you think about, first of all, what sensory means, you'll relate that to sense organs. And that's exactly what this relates to. So your main sense organs that you tend to talk about in terms of pulling in information, right? So mem and, and kind of input of information would be your eyes and your ears. And that's exactly what sensory memory takes in. So it takes in all the information passing through your sensory memory, right? All the information that passes into your brain, sorry, will pass through your sensory memory. Now it won't just be the audio and the visual, but it will retain all of that audio and visual. So auditory and visual input is what is passed through that sensory memory. Now there will be other aspects to that, but these are the main ones. So all the stuff that you see and hear, every moment of the day that passes into your brain, that goes into the sensory memory. But, and you'll probably be aware of this, it only lasts for a really, really short period of time, one or two seconds. So even from the last moment that I spoke, I won't remember exactly what word I said, and you won't remember exactly what word I said. You'll only remember it and recall it if it was actually important, right? Which is depends on what you deem as important, okay, and what your brain treats as important. So most of that information then is quickly forgotten. So the fact that I have a table in front of me is not really important to my brain. So it won't really be something that I remember and process. But some of the information that's in front of me will be deemed important and will be transferred to your first kind of main memory that you'll all have heard of, which is known as your short-term memory. Now, fortunately enough, like with a lot of things in higher, you can shorten this to STM. Okay, but if you're talking about an essay question, you should at least at one point state what STM means, and then you can decide to break it down to STM the whole time. Right, so... If we focus on what the STM is, so what the short-term memory is and what it involves. So your short-term memory um, kind of does explain itself on its own. So it has only got a limited capacity, right? So limited storage, limited memory span. So only a few pieces of information are stored there for a short period of time. So for your average Joe, it's around about five to seven pieces of information for around about 30 seconds. Now you don't need to know this information, it's just for me to give you a bit more to relate to. Now you'll know also that you can keep more information in your brain if you practice certain techniques to improve your memory. Okay. So the reason why it's only this and only lasts a short period of time is because some of that information is lost. Right? And it's lost in two ways. You can lose it by displacement Or you can lose it through what's called decay. So to explain what that means, displacement basically means that you have new information in your head and it pushes out the old stuff. So if you think about someone talking to you when you're trying to listen to someone else talking or trying to listen to what's going on in the classroom, for example, if someone else is talking to you, it kind of shoves out that stuff that someone else has said or that you're supposed to be paying attention to. So then you're like, oh, I've forgotten that. That's so annoying. That's the kind of thing that happens with displacement. It pushes out that old stuff. Okay, so it's replaced with that new stuff constantly. 
Now decay is what's called, or what's described as the loss of a memory trace. That basically just means the chemicals that are produced that would form your memory just kind of break away if it's not a strong enough memory. So something that you would have had in your brain might disappear. That's that loss of the memory trace. All right, so like I said before, you might already know that there are some ways that you can improve your memory span. You can hold more pieces of information for a longer period of time. So if you think about how you might be able to do that, it might kind of be obvious to you. Um, what I tend to frequently ask people to do is to remember a shopping list. So bread, milk, eggs and flour. Now the first thing that you would normally do, or that I would certainly do, is repeat that. So bread, milk, eggs, flour, bread, milk, eggs, flour. And you do that over and over and over again. And that is called rehearsal. So when you repeat that information many, many times, Basically what that helps to do is it helps to retain it in that short term memory. And it also then helps transfer to the long term memory. Which I'll come on to in a minute. So rehearsal is really important. Don't call it repetition because repetition is the description of what that is. Okay, you rehearse something, you repeat it over and over again. Now this can be out loud or in your head, it doesn't really matter which, they're both effective. Rehearsal is actually some of the reason why you might actually remember your times table. Because you repeat it over and over and over again. And rehearsal is also the reason why you'll probably know the words to your favourite song perfectly. It's because you keep it in your short term memory for a bit longer, but it also helps to transfer it to the long term. Now your next example that'll improve your memory span and keep it in your um, short-term memory for longer is something called chunking. Now you'll not have heard any, um, of that term probably, but you'll actually recognise it when you realise that you do it all the time. So what you do is you organise multiple pieces of information and you treat them as smaller chunks. So what you do just now is think about your phone number, your house phone number or your mobile number. You'll probably break it down into chunks. Or if you think about the Glasgow dial code for phones, it'd be 0141. But your brain treats that as one piece of information. It doesn't treat it as four values. It doesn't treat it as 0141. It treats it as one unit of information. So to give an example, I've got this number here. Now, this is one of the examples in The Simpsons of Homer Simpson's house number. So what you do is you break it down into... Like, for example, if it was Glasgow, it'd be 0141, but that would be 939, then 555, then 0113. So, for example, like the school number would be 0141, and then it would be something else and something else. Or in your mobile numbers, you would have your 07 whatever broken down into three chunks, normally. Okay? So, chunking basically allows your brain to perceive that as less information. Okay, so if you think about a phone number, um, it's normally about 11 digits. When you break that down into three chunks, you're actually treating 11 digits as three chunks, so three pieces of information. So rather than you just having, say, three pieces of information in your brain, it's actually holding 11, which is expanding your memory span. So another aspect to your short-term memory that um, you'll probably be aware of as well, you might not have known the name of it, is called the serial position effect. So serial refers to like a series, um, so think about a TV series. Um, you'll have things at the start, things at the middle, things in the end, okay, there's a series of information. So. This serial position effect, I'd asked you to um, watch a video of Jim Davidson's Generation Game, which is really old um, and a bit dated, but we'll show you exactly what I'm about to explain. So it basically shows that you will then recall certain pieces of information better depending on where they are in a position in a list. So this is a graph, okay, showing this information. So if you've been given a list of information, doesn't matter what it is, the likelihood is that the stuff, the information at the beginning and at the end of the information list will be recalled better. 
Now I keep saying this word recalled. Don't use the word remembered. Okay, remember doesn't really mean anything in this sense. Recalled is how much you can pull back from your memory. Okay, retrieved and brought back. So in this list, the first pieces of information are recalled best or better. Okay. Now the reason that is, is because they've been transferred to the long-term memory. Now that might be because they've chunked it and that's helped to maintain it and then put it into the, um, the long-term memory or because they've rehearsed it. Okay, so in that example of Jim Davidson's generation game, they, they give you things on a, a conveyor belt and what you would do is repeat the, th the things that you want over and over again. So what they tend to do is put the cheap things at the start. Now adverts will work the same way in between TV shows and on telly. So you would have the ones that are the adverts at the very start of your advert break will be really expensive ad slots because they're the ones that are remembered better. Okay, or sorry, recalled better. Now these middle pieces of information are poorly recalled. Okay, the percentage recall on that is really low. Now that is because this information is lost due to displacement. So you're trying to maintain that in your short-term memory, but everything that's coming in afterwards is pushing that out. Okay, so displacement then means that things are lost in the middle. Now at the end, these are rec recalled pretty well as well. Okay, so your percentage recall will be pretty high at the end of a list. And the reason behind that is, is because it's not yet been displaced. So it still remains in the short term memory and you'll still recall it. Okay, so all this serial position effect is some that's to do with pulling things from your short term memory and to um, maintain it in your short term memory. So start and end are both better recalled. The start because it's transferred to the long term memory, it's already been stored, and the end because it hasn't been displaced yet. But the middle is not well recalled because it has been displaced because you're just being given further and further pieces of information that will knock that out of the short-term memory. Okay, and one final aspect of the short-term memory that we've not covered yet is what's called working memory. So this is part of the short-term memory. So that allows us to carry out what's called cognitive tasks. So basically it's thinking. Um, so things like counting. Right, by working with stuff that's in your short-term memory and kind of manipulating information that you've got in your short-term memory. So the perfect example is to then imagine your house and then try to count the number of doors in that house. Okay, so you have a mental image of your house that you've pulled from your long-term memory into your short-term memory and then you're then trying to count those doors in your head while keeping that information in your short-term. Okay, so that's your working memory. So it's still a part of the short-term memory but it's called your working memory. Now, all this then is entirely useless if you don't actually store it correctly and then it's not kept in your long-term memory. Otherwise, all this stuff will eventually be displaced and pushed out. Okay, so your long-term memory is the next thing I'm going to cover. So your long-term memory is another one that you can shorten to LTM, but again, like I said before, make sure that it's clear that you understand what LTM means if you're writing an essay question. Don't just shorten it to LTM immediately. Now your long-term memory is amazing because it has an, what we describe as an unlimited storage capacity. Okay, so you can remember things that happened to you when you were potentially three or four years old. And you can remember those things when you're 90. So it has an unlimited capacity and it lasts for potentially your whole life. Now some people have a better long-term memory than others and that may be just due to practice. Okay, so I'll talk about that in a moment as to why that is. So your long-term memory, for it to actually be effective and for memories to be stored effectively, you have to transfer them in a form that your brain can store. Okay, so for information to move from the short-term memory to the long-term memory, it must be what's called encoded. Now all that encoded means, it sounds fancy, but all that it means is converted to a form that can be stored. In that long term memory. 
okay? Now, there are ways that we can then make that transfer more effective and make that encoding better so that we can then maintain that memory within our long-term memory. Now, one of them I've already covered. So one of them is rehearsal. So like I said before, the more you sing a song, the more you hear that song, the better you'll know the lyrics to it. So I can remember songs from when I, when I was 11 years old, for example, because you repeat them and repeat them and repeat them. You rehearse them. So that's that repetition of information. Now that repetition of information is what's known as shallow encoding. Okay, so it does work. And you might be able to remember your times table, but it might over time wear away. It's not necessarily the best way to store information. It's not as effective and it's not as well encoded. So what you can do is you can then organize information which basically means arranging them into related groups. So the fact that they're related makes a really um, it makes it far better to are far more effective when it's stored. So I could give you a list of a whole bunch of unrelated things, and if you group them into categories, you would remember them better. So remember my shopping list of bread, milk, eggs, flour. You could try and remember that in terms of where they are in the shop, or if you're talking about um, milk and eggs might be related because they are both from animals and bread and flour are both used to make the same thing. Okay, so flour, sorry, is used to make bread, for example, so you might relate them together and that might help you to store them and help you to encode them in your long-term memory. The final one, though, is the most effective by far and it's called elaboration of meaning. Now, this is what's called elaborative encoding. Okay, and that's what's going to result in a higher quality memory. So what that means is it's far more likely that you're going to be able to store that correctly and then retrieve it far longer down the line. Okay, so when you move from rehearsal down to elaboration of meaning, it becomes far more effective and a better quality of memory. So elaboration of meaning, if you think about the word elaborate, you talk more and more about what you're maybe originally talking about. So you elaborate on it, you give more detail. And that's exactly what elaboration of meaning means when it comes to memories. So you add meaning or more information to that original piece of information that you had. So for example, just as a, a general example, your granny or a person that you know and love. You don't just remember their face. You remember how they smell and what jumper they wore and what they cooked you that one time and what their perfume smelled like or what their aftershave smelled like, what their house looks like. So you're adding more and more information on it. It gives you a, a fuller picture. Now, some people use this elaboration of meaning um, to create memory palaces. So these people that will imagine a house and they'll walk into the house and walk into the living room and they'll have information stored there in their house. These are the people that will be far better at rem um, recalling information and storing that information than people that would just use rehearsal, for example. Okay? So... All this stuff that I've talked about in terms of encoding and then storing it in your long-term memory is only useful if you can actually pull it back. I can store all that stuff in my long-term memory, but I actually need to be able to retrieve it as well and pull it back out of my long-term memory to use. Okay, so that is what's called retrieval. So retrieval is aided by trying to relate them into categories. Okay, so you want them to have them in related categories. So for example, holidays or family or pets or whatever else. Okay, those related categories help to then pull that information back out and recall it. The one that we often talk about though, which you'll probably relate to more, is what's called contextual cues. So I've given a definition of a contextual cue here, but it only really makes sense when you elaborate on it, like I was talking about. So these are signals or reminders that will relate to the conditions that were there when you first encoded that memory. So what that means is if you think about where you were in sitting in biology, you sit in the same seat every day. Now that's not only just because it's easier for other people, it's because if you remember where you sat in that day, you'll have the same conditions, the same environmental conditions like temperature, position in the room, smells, times of um, temperatures and all that kind of thing. All these environmental conditions that will then help you to pull back that memory. 
Now, often you can walk by someone and you can smell someone's perfume or their aftershave or see their jumper, and that'll trigger a memory. It'll trigger you to retrieve a memory because of something that has reminded you of when you first made that memory. And that's a contextual cue. All right, so I've worked my way through sensory to short term to long term. So what I'm going to do is kind of give you an overview of the whole lot. So you'll see this diagram in quite frequently when it comes to kind of questions and things like that. So sensory memory, first of all, most things are lost or forgotten. Okay, and the information that comes in to sensory memory is audio and visual information, things that come from the eyes and the ears. And it only lasts one or two seconds, and then it tends to be mostly forgotten. Now, if it's not forgotten, what it is, is transferred into your short-term memory. Now, that short-term memory, then, can lose that information in one of two ways. It can lose it by displacement, so it can be pushed out. Or it can lose it by decay. Right, so that loss of that memory trace. Now, in addition to that, you also have your working memory as a branch of your short-term memory. So that's the one that's involved in cognitive tasks. So those thinking tasks. Right, where you need to count the um, number of doors in your house. And you can maintain things in your short-term memory through rehearsal. Okay, or by chunking. Now, ultimately, you want to store all this information. So you encode it first in a method, that, in a form that can be stored. So you encode it and you store it. So you encode it and then you store it. And that means that it is pulled into the long-term memory. Now what you also want to be able to do is retrieve that information. So any information that's pulled from the long-term memory back into the short-term memory for you to process and think about is then labelled as retrieval. Okay. So methods of improving coding and storage would be things like rehearsal, organisation, and elaboration of meaning. And things that would aid retrieval are things like contextual cues. Okay, so that summarises the whole of memory.